operative action of the day. So if childhood is a community value, how do we incorporate the ideas and needs of children in urban planning is a question that should come to mind for any city uh, trying to deal with this issue. Ali Madaris is the director of the Urban Studies Program at the University of Washington, Tacoma. A great friend of Tacoma, new to this community in some respects. I think you've been here a couple of years now, Ali, too. Uh, but he still has some fresh eyes, and he's a very smart person who's data-driven, and he's going to talk to us about this issue of how we uh, incorporate childhood as a community value. Ali's bio is in your program, so please join me in welcoming Ali Madaris. Good morning. Um, Thank you, Tanya, for inviting me and the organi organizing committee. Dave, thank you for the introduction. I know exactly why I was put up here to talk to you. My job this morning is to kill all the fun. So there will be absolute adult moment for the next 30 minutes. And by the time I'm done, you'll run so fast that you would never want to hear from another adult in your life. Um, when, I, when we discussed the title of my talk, um, it came out of something I had written, which is Cities Without Children which sounds terrible, but it is not meant that way. It is something else. And I added the question mark to it so to tell you why we need to think about this phenomena, because as an academic, of course, I have to look at numbers. And when I look at numbers, there's something that you need to know about. And that's one element I'm going to talk about. But I want you to keep this in mind, that this is not about getting depressed. This is about looking at something like children and not think of it as an obstacle Think of it as a challenge. Think of it as a way that we could work with that. So one element of thinking about is most of you know. You know Seattle really well. And, and I've been here two years. I know there is a something between Seattle and Tacoma. I don't want to get involved. <laughs> but if you think about it, think about the central part of Seattle, and think about when you are out there, out beside tourists, how often do you see people who live in downtown Seattle walk around with kids? Right? Before I came here, the radio in Seattle contacted me because I had referred to Seattle as a child desert. And they wanted to know why I would do that. And, and you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very unique phenomenon. It's not they're not the only one. San Francisco is right there. LA is downtown, is turning that way. And what I will tell you this morning is that there's something unique we have done. Over the span of the last few decades, we have focused on the 20-something and 30-something to revitalize our downtowns. And in that process, we have built a specific kind of city which caters to that population. And that population doesn't mean they don't have kids. When they want to have kids, it looks like they move out. So systematically, those portions of our cities, like Manhattan, they become sort of empty of kids, not, not vitality, not activity. So because of that, there's one aspect that we need to think about. But there's also the global dimension of it that I want to kind of bring you to that for one second so you understand what the depth of this problem is. It's not a problem, remember? It is going to be a challenge. So, academic, I have to teach you something before I can actually talk about it, right? <laughs> you all grew up, if you're about my age or younger a little bit, but not too young, that you heard about zero population growth and we advocated for that one for the longest time. Yours truly did not have kids until he was late in, you know, sort of my parents were giving, giving up on me. So that moment, you begin to sort of think about two kid replacement, right? Two kids for two parents, and that's zero population growth. In demographic terminology, we talk about that total fertility rate of 2.1. That's the line. That's the line that every city, every country, and the human population as a whole has to have in order to sustain itself. 2.1 is the magic number. 1.6 is at the point where demographers say, mm, you may never come back, meaning that you're going to have a population decline. 1.3 is called total fertility trap, meaning that there is little evidence that countries that have gone below 1.3 have ever come back. So with that in mind, I want to show you randomly a series of countries to tell you what has happened in 1980s, since 1980s. Somewhere in 1980s, and you can see that dashed line of 2.1, a number of countries have gone way below. They have gone, they gradually have declined. It has nothing to do with wealth. It has nothing to do with con which continent you're in. It has to do something about cities. 
And that's the point I want to make with you. So if you look at these, it makes sense. We are looking at Macau, we are looking at Singapore, Hong Kong, we are looking at Portugal, which is not a very wealthy nation by itself. And in some ways, Poland is also in that one. South, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, Asia, you name it. It's, they are included in that. And when we begin to look at these numbers, this is what their fertility rates look like. They have gone to that level where it's difficult to come back. And as you can see, United States is 1.84. We are below the 2.1. However, we are a little bit higher for one primary reason, immigrants. The one thing that has kept us going is that we are also a nation that has other ways of growing, and that has helped us quite a bit. And at 1.93, we are declining to 1.84 as, as the latest data. But by my count, there are 37 countries now below 1.6. And when we look at cities, something alarming began to happen. And that is, you look at, you know about Tokyo, Singapore, and Kyoto. They are significantly below the 1.3. And below one, now we have two cities, Shanghai and Seoul. These are cities that have gone to a point where return is going to be very difficult for them. Now, let me not depress you. <laughs> Let's think about the US. Everyone this morning has covered my talk, so at this point I could just step down and let you think about all the things that I've told you to do and just do those. I'm just gonna share a little bit something more with you, and one of them is being that, yes, it is costly to raise kids. By the age 18, by estimate of 2013, which is the most recent estimate, you're looking about $245,000 to raise a child to 18 years of age. And by the time you send them to university, you're looking at nearly $319,000. You can buy a nice little condo with that if you don't want to have a kid. So, and if you live in the West, add another $16,000 for good measures. We have states that are still doing well in terms of their fertility rate. They are higher than others at 2.1 and counting. And as we go through, you will see that there are also states that numbers have gone close to 1.6. Rhode Island is one of them. So I told you I was going to kill the fun. These are all numbers, right? But here's the basic element of this. As we begin to take a look at this, we see that there is a reason in some places there are more kids, and in other places there are less, less kids. This morning we heard, don't look at who has failed. Let's take a look and see who has done what and what can we learn from that. But if you permit me, I want to show you a few maps. And I'll be, just to make a point, this is a map of our region. You see 90 going across east-west, you see five going north-south, and you know where they meet is Seattle, right? So this is percent population under 18, and you will see that in fact downtown Seattle doesn't have a lot. And in our downtown area, there isn't a lot either. In fact, if I zoom in, this is the downtown of Seattle, which basically has less than 10% kids around. And when I look at downtown Tacoma, and look at Tacoma itself, is the port area, which makes sense, and the downtown area that doesn't have a lot of kids. The rest of it looks pretty decent in terms of having the number of kids. But then there is the population growth, which we did really well across the last 20 years, and I'm gonna go quickly here. The one thing that I did not have the heart to zoom in is to show you that in fact there has been a declining number of kids in Tacoma as well as in Seattle. There's a reason for that. Across the last 15 years, the population that Pierce County has lost is 30 something plus their kids. For whatever reason, that's the population that's packing up and leaving gradually. That's all the end of the depressing talk, I promise you. So, how do we compare it to that nice neighbor up north really well still? We have quite a few, see I'm here to boost the coma, so here I am. <laughs> 23 percent, which is really a good number, one out of four, nearly. More diverse population, and this is the interesting part. We have quite a few Latino kids. That's really important, yeah. So in, in some ways, Tacoma has an asset. In a world of diversity, in a world that wants to be globalized, you do want a diverse population, and congratulations, Tacoma, you have it. The element that is sort of also interesting is the involvement of grandparents. Quite a little bit larger percentage of kids in Tacoma are with their, grand, uh, with their grandmothers, and there's a little bit more foster child around, but that's 
just a small difference between us and Seattle. There are a couple other things to think about. We have a little bit higher rates of disability. We have a larger attendance at public school compared to Seattle. And we have diversity of socioeconomic status. And I thought maybe it would be good for you to know that the difference between us and Seattle is about half of the income. So the kids who live in households in, in Seattle typically are well, a little bit better than middle class. And for us, it's perfect family of $51,000 on the average, right? But it is significantly lower than Seattle. We have higher dependence uh, for the households that have kids for public assistance. 26%, they live in households that are below poverty line, and they typically are in renter population. I lied, I was going to depress you a little bit more. <laughs> but I have to deliver the news little by little. I learned from my doctors. They don't just come out and spill things out. <laughs> so, um, there are things that we can think about. Um, children are competing with economic rationality. We know that. Most parents look look at their income, look at what they, the way they're living, they decide to not have kids or have only one, and things begin to sort of change for them. But there is something unique about us, and that is as children and children uh, uh, child-friendly and family-friendly cities decline in number, Tacoma has a very unique niche that it can occupy. It's a very unique ability. Instead of the 2030-something, let me go on record of saying, this is, a, this is the town, this is the city that wants to rec be recognized as a family-friendly, child-friendly city. That's the area we want to compete in, not the 2030-something. We are a city that relatively has quite a bit of open space. We have one of the largest parks. We have a waterfront that I will talk about in a second. Where is the, I promise to not talk about 705. So. <laughs> so we, but as friendly as we are to our children, as great as our city is, we need to do a little bit more, and the remainder of my talk is dedicated to that. So how do we do that? How do we become more friendly toward family and toward children? And how does the city actually become or remain a child-friendly city? I think Clay has covered this, so thank you, Clay. I'm going to go sit down again now, is it right? No? All right. <laughs> um, you may not know but there's actually handbooks on that. I shouldn't be giving this talk. I should be just distributing UNICEF's booklets and all the manuals that exist on this. UNICEF has a series of things that have to, has written about, but there's a small report called Building Child-Friendly Cities, a Framework for Action, and Agenda 21 for International Obligations includes being child-friendly, despite the fact that some cities have a fertility rate of 0.7. So in some ways, a child-friendly city is committed to the fullest implementation of the Convention of the Rights of Children. And among those, there's some 12 items in that one. I will focus on a few. Influence decisions about their city, express their opinion on the city they want, walk safely in the streets on their own, have green spaces for plants and animals. These are the four things I just want to highlight because I don't have all the time to go through all the 12 elements. So this all makes sense, right? Is there anything on this, this four are, are just weird? No, we know all about that, we want all of that. So as we begin to think about what needs to be done, we want to think of planning and design framework. Now, why do that? Because I'm biased, I'm talking about my own discipline, and by the way, if you have children who are looking for majors, urban studies and urban design and urban planning is where they want to be. You can't have a child-friendly city without having students who major in it. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about three frameworks to think about. Cities for children. This is an advocacy style of planning and design. I will talk a little bit about that one. The second one is cities by children. This is when we put children in the front seat and say, what do you want? You shall inherit this earth. Well, what would you like, right? What part of, what can I leave you? That's when we put them into the driver's seat. And there's a third way to think about it, which is specifically cities as if children matter, or as advocates would tell you, after we have done this for almost two decades now, we would say cities with children. There's a criticism in the way we have approached kids in some circles is that hand everything to them and let them decide and not get involved. 
cities with children also create sets of responsibilities for us. It doesn't sort of pass all the, all the buck to them. So in some ways, cities with children is where we want to be, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of these and give you a few ideas and examples. This falls, as I said, under advocacy. Two of our colleagues, uh, Mark Francis and Ray, uh, Lorenzo Rowe, have written about that style of, of, of uh, working with children. And one of the things that, that is important about this style is the degree to which we actively think about children. Now, I'm going to focus on two elements, health and safety. And as Clay said this morning, this is really important without excessive risk aversion. One of the things that parents have done across the last two decades or so, somehow we systematically remove children for anything that is called risk. We drive them to school. We try to walk with them. We don't let them sort of coalesce with other kids. At, at home, we structure their lives a little too much. We tell them how to play or what not to do. So in some ways, we have taken away the exterior spaces from them, and we have not done one thing, and that is we have not made cities fun for them. If anything, we have made cities scary for them because everything they hear is about what not to do outside the house. Don't talk to strangers. Don't play outside. After dark, I need you in. Where are you? How are you going to do this? Let me give you a cell phone, but by, secretly, I'm monitoring your movement, right? <laughs> so there are certain things we can do in urban design. There are certain things we cannot do in urban design. We cannot get you off your phone. <laughs> so city of Hayward in California decided to be funny, and they started putting up signs. This is one of them. Cross, then update your Facebook. There are ways that we can handle this issue also. This is another sign they had which I like. This is speed limit, not a suggestion. <laughs> right? So in some ways, what we are really trying to say is that you need to calm yourselves down, adults, in order for children to operate in this city. You need to slow down. We can slow you down, but you won't like it. Speed bumps, roundabouts, see, we all complain about them. Ugh. Roundabouts are not our favorite things, right? Why roundabouts are there is to slow you down. I know you're late to your meeting, but slow down, right? There are other ways that in the old world it was done, which we don't do anymore which is in, 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 in urban design is called short blocks. One of the things that kids get into trouble everywhere is to cross the street because it's too long to go to the, to the next sidewalk. They cross it and they can't see and you can't see them. And if you have streets on street parking, those little guys, as they come between the cars out, they can't be seen. So it is important to have short blocks. That's the simplest urban design solution I can offer first thing in the morning. So if you, anything you're going to remember, remember that one. But here is one thing that we can do better than that. And notice I blocked all the license plates so you wouldn't know what, where that is. So kids should not be walking on street. We need connected sidewalks. We need to actually begin to think about sidewalks as an important mode of transportation for children and invest in it, not four lane streets, just for our cars to zoom down. So there, there is an international movement called Save uh, Kids Lives that has been working on this one. United Nation actually has done quite a bit around this issue. And a, and a portion of it is, has to do with the fact that internationally, one of the killer of children is our cars. And so they have been trying to work very hard to actually sort of deal with that dilemma, specifically in developing countries. And I, I find it quite fascinating. This was in September last year, 2014, a whole bunch of news outlets in the United States wrote about this one city in China in which the sidewalk is divided between those who use cell phone and those who don't use their cell phone, right? <laughs> so if that's that important, why not do something that they have done in Korea? In Seoul and many other cities have done that. They have actually separated if you can't control adults, help the children, right? This is city for children. This is when you actively think about what would a three foot tall person do? I'm just a little bit over that one. That's why I'm standing up here. <laughs> so what would somebody my height do in a city that everybody's over tall? So in some ways, we need to sort of think about that one and think about incorporating that. There are other activities we have done, blocking streets. Letting, giving the streets back to kids 
for weekends, for some days, allowing him to sort of play and understand the city is not dangerous. But more than anything else, when it comes to fun, we love the sort of a scripted fun. What is scripted fun? When you take those play items and put it in your backyard. So you're literally telling the child, well, you don't need to go to the park because we got all this stuff in the backyard. But the socializing element is gone. So what do you do? You do play dates. Play dates is selective on who comes and who doesn't come. So essentially, you're telling your children the second thing. There are some people we mix with. There are some people we don't mix with. Right? So in some ways, as we begin to think about fun for children, we need to get ourselves out of it. This is a walk to school. Right? Very simple, very elegant. Nice to look at. And in some ways, a child knows that this is for them it, and, and for David, because I'm sure he would skate down that way too. <laughs> but the most important element that I can tell you to think about are what our colleagues call the accidental playground. This book is a story of how the East Riverside uh, State Park went through this whole history of how it was a political debacle. It took a long time for this park to be actually thought through and they didn't have money. But meanwhile, the folks in that area called it the Brooklyn Riviera and they played in a place that was polluted. It had garbage in it and everything and kids enjoyed it tremendously. Why? Because it was unscripted. Children don't think of parks in design terms. They think about how to appropriate spaces and how to play. Think of the way that you give them a box when they're little, you just came back from Costco, wherever you were, and they play with it. You bought them the most expensive toy on the planet and they're playing with the box, right? Because they are trying to put it on their head, they're trying to go inside it, they're trying to figure out how to figure it out. They do the same thing with cities. They are trying to figure out how to fit inside the city, how to play, and they will do it this way. There is another way we can think about it. In Adelaide, Australia, actually, I don't know if we can do that. We have done it a little bit here, but I'll talk about it in just a, just a just tiny bit. They actually uh, submitted a design that incorporated an element of risk in what they call the natural playscape. Began to sort of give to kids the possibility of experiencing a park in the way perhaps my generation did. My parents sent me away to go play. Hopefully I came back at night. So in some ways the kids do something and here, if you live in a nation where lawsuits are quite active, what happens? The designer thinks twice about doing something like that. So if you want tree huggers, which I do, you want them to play in this kind of environment. Otherwise, how would they know? How would they know how to experience nature if everything is, is controlled for them? Now let me move to uh, oh, just one element I want to tell you a little bit. There are a couple of things that you need to know there is something called free-range parenting. I don't know if how many of you know about that one. How many knew about free-range parenting? Awesome. There are free-range playgrounds too. So we need to sort of begin to have a conversation. That terminology needs to come back. Environmental psychologists call that managed risk. So in other words, you plan, but you make it so that it doesn't look like you planned. So it's a manipulation, but there it is. This. <laughs> This city is by and with children. I put them all together. It's a romantic approach. I hate to tell you this. We have always fantasized how kids could help us. But if you make it with children, which means you get involved, it becomes quite interesting. I thought I'll show you an example from Summer Fall. This fall, the Game Workshop set out to investigate how the map of Denmark in Minecraft could be a platform for user involvement in urban planning. More precisely, the project aimed at involving children in creating a vision for the future of Albertslund. Our goal was to deliver a prototype of an educational design which was to be presented at a conference for policymakers. The challenge was to utilize the virtual urban space as an environment for children to present their ideas. This approach was developed further into a format that easily could be made accessible in an educational context. Our working title was Albertslund, the children's town, and we challenged ourselves to make urban planning into a game. In this phase, the Game Workshop experimented with urban planning in Minecraft and tested a game concept with primary school students from local schools. This process culminated in a workshop with a fifth grade class from a local school. Can I put 
nogle nye visioner undervejs. Øh, vi er i gang med at bygge et højhus. Fordi ja. ellers er der ikke nok boliger til 20 boliger. Der, så der er ikke nok plads til det, vi mindre vi bygger etage. The class was divided into six groups, each representing architect studios, competing to deliver the best proposal for a residential area. We chose an area which the municipality was developing to be the building site. Each studio was assigned an area and were commissioned to create 20 homes in that area. The first day's challenge was to create the buildings, to make room for the 20 homes and to organize them on the building site. Vi vi var nede om at det skulle være sådan en firkant, men nu er det blevet sådan lidt skrot, fordi vi havde ikke så meget plads at bygge på. The second day's work focused on the areas around the houses, and solutions to making the area more appealing to children were created. Both days, students were working towards a deadline, after which the municipal director and mayor paid them a virtual visit at their construction sites. Ja, det går svært. Det er meget fint. Jeg kan meget godt lide den måde, I har fået natur og miljø ind. The workshop ended with the declaring of the winning proposal. A very difficult task indeed, to give children the idea that they could come up with concepts that this city would actually consider. It wasn't something that you let's do this as a game and it's the end of it. It actually goes to decision makers to see how children see cities and how they behave in terms of building new plans. Did you notice what the child said if you read the subtitle? The child said there wasn't enough space, we, had, we needed to add floors. A fifth grader had figured out how to deal with that limitation, right? And they were telling each other, how many of you know about Minecraft? All right, you know it's a, it's a, it's, it's a collaborative game, right? So the children were telling each other, could somebody build that one while I'm doing this one? So they have understood that. Not, Denmark is not the only place. We have it in Baton Rouge. APA in, in Washington started the, the, the kids in planning in 2008. So we have those, we just need to utilize them in Tacoma in a way that allows us to see the city through their eyes, but in the way we can implement this. In other words, cities with children is quite important for us. I also want to recommend, because of two years here, Dave said that I would say stuff like that, so here it comes. Our sidewalks are not the best in the world, you know it. I'm not, I'm just saying it inside this room. I don't want anybody in Seattle to know this. So in some ways, what we could do is to use the basic technique that a lot of cities have used. You hand children cameras, you ask them to document their pedestrian experience, they come back with something called a photo voice, you assemble that one, and it's a form of visual ethnography. You, al you allow children to tell you, you ask children to tell you how they see the cities, specifically the sidewalks, but it is important to go to, go to the last part, which is to use that in our road safety and improvement projects. So look at those as a way of seeing the world. Uh, there are a couple of other examples. I've just chosen them randomly. I'm going to talk two seconds about them. This is, a, this is an educational aspect. Environmental education is an ecological restoration that was done in Japan. And actually, kids played full role in a place not unlike our Foss Waterway. It's a place that needed repairing. It needed a place, somebody to come and work with it. They got children involved. That, and they played every role from designing it from the basic to the shape that you saw. Now, cities as if children matter. And I'm just going to bring it to the end. It should have been obvious to you by now that an inclusive and family-friendly city includes children in its planning. So when we use the word inclusive, we don't mean only adults of different diversity and different backgrounds and so on. We mean age as well. To do otherwise would be to deny and exclude the voice of the next generation. So if you don't include kids, you are basically excluding somebody who is very important. So a city that cares about children focuses on what they need. Access to quality education, affordable housing, health care, and a robust economy that helps it stabilize communities. See what happens as soon as it gets adult-like, it becomes very serious, right? But one issue that's very important, kids can tell you what they need, but are we willing to provide it? Are we willing to think about the ways we could improve our educational environment? how we could think about affordable housing and all the other elements. Children need to see that we care about equity and social justice, so we need to model it for them and that we are not self-centered and self-indulgent. You can't tell a kid you need to play well if you yourself don't play well. 
And if you think of the city in a particular way, you can begin to see how they see it as our playground. We should celebrate them every day by building a better and more thriving city. I encourage us to think about the fact that city is a habitat for human beings. It is only thing we got. Looks like more than half of us now live in cities. We can do better. We can build better cities than we have inherited. Maybe our voice was not included. We can include theirs. So we should value them, not just because they're small and cute, but because they're thinking without boundaries. They can think of something that we may not be able to think about. They do not have obstacles. You heard from Clay. They didn't think about the fact that something couldn't be solved. They're thinking about how to solve it. They didn't, they didn't give up. So in some ways, if we do everything correctly, we need to show them what David did this morning. We need to show them that we are kids ourselves and we want them to play in the only sandbox we have. It's called the city. And that's how you build a child-friendly, family-friendly city. Thank you so much and thank you for your indulgence.